So today we have Anita Woolley, who's uh, here from Carnegie Mellon's Tepper School of Business. Um, Anita uh, was named one of the most influential organizational psychologists in 2014 by Human Resources NBA Magazine. And she's widely known for research on collective intelligence, which was first published back in 2010 along with Tom Malone, and has also been featured in NPR and New York Times and Forbes magazine. And today's talk, I think, is going to talk about that work, that original work, and then all the ways I've extended it since 2010. So with that, let's welcome Anita. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to, to be out here uh, to enjoy some of your weather and your views uh, coming all the way from Pennsylvania. So as um, Stephen mentioned, I'm going to uh, just give a little overview of some of the original work that kind of led us down this path. And then I want to share with you a more recent study that actually hasn't come out yet, um, but one of the ways that we're uh, extending this work into the crowdsourcing area. So I thought it might be something you guys might be interested in. Um, so before I go too much further, I'm going to just acknowledge, I'm going to say we a lot. So this is some of the we that I'm talking about. Uh, and I want to start off with actually a, a short example or a couple of examples to get, give you an intuition for what got us interested uh, in this work. So in each example, I'm going to talk about a pair of teams. And I want you to think you know, to yourself, which of these teams do I think would be more successful? So the first pair of teams involves two men's ice hockey teams from two different Olympics. So the first team, uh, I'm not going to reveal initially which teams these are, but you might recognize them if you're a hockey fan. Um, the first team was in a recent Olympics. Uh, their country was the host of the Olympics that year. They were stacked with star players from around the NHL and the KHL uh, and widely expected to you know, sweep the Olympics and bring home the gold medal. And, and hopefully they were hoping to do so because prominent politicians in their country were actually quoted as saying that the $50 billion that their country spent getting ready to the, for the Olympics would all be worthwhile if this team brought home the gold medal. So hard to imagine a team uh, better endowed with talent, more motivated uh, to deliver than this team. Now compare that to this team, also a team uh, whose, whose home country was the host uh, of the Olympics. However, in this case, the country had been uncertain if they were going to even be entering a team uh, in the competition. And so this team was not convened until about 10 months before the Olympics began. Uh, they were made up of a bunch of collegiate and amateur players uh, coached by a college coach. And mostly people didn't expect too much from them, just hoped that they wouldn't totally embarrass them uh, you know, w during the Olympics. Now, most of us would expect that the team on the left would actually be more successful. But those of you who know hockey know the team on the left was uh, the Russian men's ice hockey team from the most recent Winter Olympics. They were actually eliminated from contention before the medal rounds even began. The team on the right is the subject of the movie Miracle on Ice and other uh, books that cover the 1980 US men's uh, ice hockey team who defied all expectations and brought home the gold medal. Okay. Another example from a, a different arena. This time, presidential cabinets. So we recently had an election. I'm not going to talk about that. However, um, what I will say is a lot of times we think we're electing a person, but in fact what we're electing is a person and his or her cabinet, right? Uh, the team of advisors, which we're learning more about uh, what's coming on that now uh, in the upcoming um, cabinet. But these are some cabinets from history. So the, the one here uh, is a cabinet made up of individuals that one historian in term the best and the brightest, uh, very accomplished, Ivy League educated uh, men, uh, some of whom were very close friends, even family members of the president. Uh, compared to one from clearly an earlier era, uh, these were men, some of whom lacked extensive formal education. Some of these were bitter rivals of the president in, the, in a, a very hotly contested presidential primary. Uh, and so, you know, overall, not, a, not seeming like a friendly group of people. 
Most of us, again, would expect the group on the left to be much more successful. Uh, however, those who followed anything about US history probably recognize the group on the left as the Kennedy cabinet, which was known for many decision-making debacles that led to things like the Cuban Missile Crisis, et cetera. Um, the group on the right is the Lincoln cabinet, known for passing historic legislation despite a deeply divided country, if we think we're divided now, think Civil War, right? Um, and uh, passing legislation that, that eventually uh, ended slavery, led to the end of slavery. What these examples are really meant to underscore is the, the general notion that when we think about team performance, we tend to fo focus a lot on the attributes of the individuals on the team and perhaps the motivational and relational circumstances of the team. But what we got interested, what got us interested in this line of work, were really you know all the examples, and you could go on and on and pull out examples that would follow uh, from the groups on the right. What is it that leads groups like these to perform uh, far beyond? Beyond anybody's expectations. Uh, and so we believe that part of that answer uh, is this idea of collective intelligence that we've been working on. But the reason why we look a lot to individual intelligence is because we have very good metrics for individual intelligence. And that's largely due to this guy, Charles Spearman, early in the 20th century. He observed that school kids that did well in one uh, academic subject tended to do well in other academic subjects and set about studying that uh, empirically and systematically and came up with the early precursors of, of what we know now as, as general intelligence. And so general intelligence, while it's a, a controversial topic, uh, in some circles, what we know empirically, a, 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 a finding that's been replicated thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of times by now, is that uh, you can give an individual a test uh, with a limited range of, of questions covering a limited range of domains, and their score on that test will predict outcomes in a broad variety of domains over a long period of time. So more recent studies have shown you know, uh, measures of individual IQ in childhood predict not only school success, but career success, whether or not you're likely to become an unwed teenage parent, and even life expectancy. So many outcomes over many different domains. And so it's a very useful metric uh, in some ways and something that gives you very concise information about individuals. So we wondered if the same could be true of teams. Can we measure an ability of a team to work together um, and put even a neat little number on it, ideally, um, that would predict how that team would uh, make use of the resources and opportunities that they have available and predict how that team is going to perform in the future um, across uh, many domains, potentially over time. Uh, and so that's what we went into this research wondering if we would find evidence of. And so in our initial studies, what we did, uh, and I'm just going to give you, like I said, a an overview, a quick overview of some of the earlier studies where we looked at this as, as really a hypothesis. Is there evidence of collective intelligence? Are there teams that can perform well across domains? If we can come up with a measure of that ability, can we predict how those teams perform in the future? Uh, does this exist in online settings? And then more recent work where we look at it uh, in crowd-based teams. So in this first study, it was really a hypothesis. It was you know, a research question, does collective intelligence exist? If we have teams come and work on very different kinds of problems, is there evidence that certain teams will perform well on all of them better than, than other teams? So uh, we did this work uh, at MIT and at CMU. We brought groups into the lab. They spent the better part of the day together working on all kinds of different tasks. We also measured their individual intelligence as well. And so when we're sampling tasks, we're really looking at um, you know, the attributes of the task and how a group works together in working on that task to really look at group processes and a wide range of them. So there are existing task taxonomies that identify these processes. The best known are from McGrath and Larson. And what they really you know, kind of point out is that you know, generate problems, which are your typical brainstorming problems, involve very divergent thinking kinds of processes. You actually want members to be working relatively independently to come up with lots of creative ideas. By contrast, choose or decision-making processes really 
require more convergent processes where you identify who might have the best information to solve this particular problem or maybe different pieces of information need to be put together. Uh, negotiate problems are those that have uh, competing objectives uh, where uh, individual competing motives where in some ways you need to cooperate but also there, there are issues of individual interest at stake that have to be negotiated. And then finally, execution processes where we're not, we're not developing things, we're not making decisions, we're just making a bunch of stuff very quickly and accurately and coordinating our, our psychomotor activities over time to be able to do that effectively. So we sampled um, from this, this whole range. Uh, we took things that were verbal, things that were nonverbal, things that were mathematical, things that were artistic to try to um, sample a bunch of content domains as well. And basically what we found was pretty strong evidence that uh, you know, we, we had five kind of distinct task types as we clustered all of them, we found pretty strong evidence that groups that did well on one kind of task type did well on other kinds of tasks, task types. And when we calculated a collective intelligence score on the basis of how they performed, so think group IQ test, if you will, um, uh, an, an, an IQ score uh, for the team itself, we could then <coughs> predict how they performed when we brought them back to the lab later to perform a video game simulation together. And furthermore, we could predict uh, with much more accuracy than knowing the average IQ of the individual members. So up to this point, when teams researchers had looked at intelligence in teams, it was usually as a function of the uh, intelligence of the individual members. And so what we, for this to have practical utility, it was important that it really predict something other than, uh, that, than what could be predicted no, with knowledge of individual IQ. So we replicated this um, a few times and uh, what we found pretty consistently was that collective intelligence was a much stronger predictor of future performance than knowing the average or the maximum IQ uh, of the individual members of the team. So uh, we also have gone on both in these studies and then subsequent studies to try to look at, well, if it's not individual IQ that predicts collective intelligence, you know, what is it? What is it about the team or the members uh, of the team? And so we've, we've looked at a number of things. Um, first, we started with some of the common uh, things that, that teams researchers look at, things like group satisfaction, cohesion, motivation. And what we find consistently, both in these initial studies and, and subsequently, is that um, there isn't a consistent correlation with collective intelligence, positive or negative. So, that's uh, an intriguing thing that we're, we're continuing to follow up on now um, to try to understand more why that might be. We have not found any consistent correlations with different dimensions of personality. Uh, you know, in some isolated studies, we might find a weak correlation with agreeableness or a weak negative correlation with um, neuroticism, but nothing consistent um, across our samples. One thing we did not set out expecting to find, but observed over and over again, is that the proportion of women in the team seems to have uh, a correlation with collective intelligence. And so actually this is um, an aggregation of about 600 teams from our, our current database. We haven't published uh, this finding yet. Um, but what we did is we, we classified each team, uh, with, and these teams vary a little bit in size from about three to six. Um, so we characterize each team with regard to if it's all male, or if there's just one female but the rest are male, or if it's majority male but more than one female, 50-50 majority female, solo male, all female. So collective intelligence is a standardized score where zero is average. And what you can see is that teams kind of oscillate around the mean up to the point where they are majority female and then they're more consistently above uh, average collective intelligence all the way up until they have just one guy and then it goes back to average when it's all women. We don't know what's going on here. I mean, well, we have, we have speculation, but we don't have any systematic uh, test of what might be going on there. Um, but what it suggests is that gender diversity seems to have a positive effect on collective intelligence with a tilt toward having more women than men. Um, we don't see any clear uh, advantage for just having women. So guys, we still need you. Yes? Uh, what is the sample size? Well, this was not an experiment. This is a meta-analysis of a bunch of experiments we've done. There's about 600 teams represented here. And it's about equally 
distributed across these. So, but one of the other things that we find um, that in part explains this finding is another attribute we measure, uh, which comes from the general literature on theory of mind uh, called social perceptiveness. So all of our participants take uh, a test called the reading the mind in the eyes test, which has participants look at 35 pictures of the eye region of the face and to um, make an assessment of what this person might be thinking or feeling and, and to choose from four options. So, does anybody want to hazard a guess? Irritated. Irritated? Playful. playful. So, playful is actually the correct answer. Thanks for being my, my straight guy. Um, this is one of the harder ones, um, so that's why I pull it out to make it more of an interesting um, example. What we find is that in our sample, um, women score higher than men um, on tests such as these, and that's true in the population overall. And when we factor that into the analysis, that explains a large proportion of the effect of having more women uh, on collective intelligence, that you effectively raise the average, if you will, um, on skills like this. Uh, some some um, samples, that doesn't explain all of it, so there's still something else going on, and then as I showed you, we have that curvilinear effect um, to try to understand what happens when we when we get rid of the guy so um, but social perceptiveness is, a, is an important part of it so we also look at a variety of things about communication and this is going to come up again when I tell you about our more recent study um, in our initial studies we had um, participants in the lab wearing these sociometric badges which are uh, innovated by one of our collaborators Sandy Pentland at the media lab uh, it measures all kinds of interesting things about um, interpersonal distance and, and nonverbal language but we were interested in um, patterns of speaking and interrupting and what we found in our initial studies and, and subsequently is that an uneven distribution of speaking patterns negatively predicts C. So if you have one or a few people dominating the conversation in the team, the team uh, is significantly less collectively intelligent. So uh, in a subsequent study, which I think some of you discussed, it sounds like earlier today, um, we went on to try to do, accomplish a couple of things. And so um, number one, I don't know if you remember when I was talking about the first study, how I said we brought in these groups and it was like several hours in the lab, like most of a day, right? So we wanted to create a platform to try to come up with analogs of the tasks we used in the lab that could be administered to people who weren't necessarily working face to face, or even if they were, it could be administered much more quickly so that we, it would be more practical to do more of these studies. So we spent a couple years actually um, developing this platform that would enable us to um, administer our tasks uh, in, in such a way. And so it's a, a platform where we can you know, show people the instructions, they can see one another working, they each have, it's, it's like an etherpad based thing, so they each have different colors and you can see what different people are writing, they can chat to each other, there's a timer that automatically moves them on to the next task when this task is over, etc. Um, so we came up with uh, tasks that are, were good analogs to the ones that we uh, used in the lab and so in this study we were really just wondering if this would function in the same way um, as our original set of tasks and if it would function simul similarly for teams that were working face-to-face uh, -face, uh, versus in a more distributed environment. So in this study, whoops, whoa, whoa, come back. Um, in this study we had 68 groups um, of four people, um, and we randomly assigned them to either work face to face, in which case they sat around a table with laptops, and so they all worked on the their they did worked on their own computer, but they could talk and see each other. Or we distributed them, so they didn't know who they were talking to or working with at all. Um, they only knew what was revealed to them uh, through the chat. So our first question, as I mentioned, was does this function similarly? And so uh, one of the pieces of evidence that we were looking at um, is, is a little old fashioned because we have better ways to test this, but this is the best way to illustrate this. Um, when psychologists are, are wondering if there's a general factor of intelligence for individuals or a general factor of collective intelligence for teams, they look at this thing called a scree plot, which is from a factor analysis. And basically they look at, you know, is there a very strong first factor? and then where is the elbow um, that where there's a, a big uh, drop off in the amount of variance accounted for by subsequent factors. And so what this shows you is that 
Um, the, the green and the purple lines are from our first two studies from the science paper. Um, and then the red and the blue lines are from this new uh, study, one face-to-face -face and one online. And what you see is that the profile of these plots is pretty much identical. So it kind of tells you that, um, A, you know, the, this, this test kind of functions very similarly despite being administered in this very different way. And also that it, it functions similarly for teams working online versus face-to-face, -face, which we didn't know if that would be true because we really wondered if we might see more variability in how an online group works on a brainstorming task versus a decision-making task versus an execution task such that we wouldn't see a consistent factor of collective intelligence in that setting, um, but, but we did. We also found some other consistencies that we didn't necessarily expect. Uh, and so the first one is uh, related to communication. So the online teams were communicating via chat not audio, we didn't give them any audio connection. They were just chatting in that little box. Uh, and because they were working on this platform, we could keep track of who was actually doing the work or answering the different questions. So we had a good measure of, of actual contribution to work products as well. And what we found in both conditions, and then we had audio streams for the, the teams working face to face, in both conditions, equality of communication was important, um, as well as equality of uh, contribution to the work products, and just more communication overall. So that was a, another consistent thing across the two conditions. And then the final thing, and this probably surprised us the most, uh, reading the mind in the eyes was just as predictive of collective intelligence in the online teams as in the face-to-face -face teams. So these are people who can't see each other. Um, they don't know, you know uh, what, what your facial expression is, but uh, those of you who saw the paper know we titled it Reading the Mind in the Eyes or Reading Between the Lines. They're still picking up on subtle cues that are present from how other people are interacting in the space and the communications they're sending or they're not sending. And so these abilities are still playing a facilitating role even in that context. Um, and I don't know if I brought this graph. No, I didn't. Um, there's another graph that I have from this study looking at proportion of women. So proportion of women was also just as predictive in both conditions. And again, not clear that people knew if they were collaborating with a male or a female, you know, depending on if they gave their name or not. We tried to go back and code, and that wasn't done consistently enough for it to be clear to us if people knew um, the gender of the, of the people who were in their team. So something, again, about um, the presence of women is playing a facilitating role. And interestingly, in the online condition, you know, that dip I showed you where when we lost the one guy and it was all women, uh, it declined back to average. In the online team, it didn't. It actually uh, stayed above average. So again, probably some ambiguity about if it's all girls here or not actually helped um, in that case. So we've, um, a, a couple other things about measuring collective intelligence. People have asked often, is this a stable property of a group? Because the studies I've told you about, you know, we've measured this in lab teams, you know, and maybe we have them come back a couple days later or, or whatever, or even a couple hours later and do some other task. But is this a stable um, property of existing teams? And so we've actually administered it in a few different settings. Um, so we have done it with teams of strangers uh, where we just, it, separate it by an hour or so. Some, sometimes we have teams, we get them to come back two, uh, two weeks later. Um, but the most interesting one to me is the fact that there is really no difference between this coefficient and this coefficient. These are student teams, some of whom were actually in a course about teams, um, trying to learn how to operate more effectively in teams. And so in some ways, it was a little discouraging to me that that was actually so stable. Because it's like, OK, I guess we didn't teach them very much about how to improve how their teams work. But um, the, the first measure was taken in the first day of class where they got to know their teams. And so you know, right when they met, and the other one was, was administered after uh, the teams were finished with their semester long project. And so when we look at um, similar tests, looking at individual intelligence tests, we see that the coefficients are pretty similar. So really does suggest that this is built on some qualities that are evident very early on um, in a group's life uh, that set the stage for other processes to unfold, which really create the stable capability um, that might be harder to alter than at least my colleagues and I thought when we first started this work. 
Uh, and, and we do find uh, in a variety of settings that is predictive of, of future performance. So I've told you about the face-to-face -face lab groups, uh, the online lab groups as well. Uh, the collective intelligence tests we use in a variety of student teams now in various um, courses working on projects. We pretty consistently predict how those teams perform on their project due uh, at the end of the term. There were some computer programming teams from um, a collaboration with some colleagues in Germany and we predicted how they uh, performed um, based on some judging of their uh, products three months later uh, and in, in a recent um, study that's going to come out in the CSCW we looked at um, teams playing League of Legends and uh, collective intelligence predicted their performance over a six-month period um, following the measurement so uh, you know seems to predict in a variety of environments and we continue to try to work with organizations to see uh, you know if there's some other naturalistic environments that we can can use this in as well. So, uh, you know, just to kind of transition now to telling you about our newer study, you know, what I, what I think I've told you so far um, suggests to us anyway that, um, you know, collective intelligence appears, appears to be a relatively stable attribute. Um, it takes shape very quickly, it shapes subsequent group performance, and that it really seems to be built largely on, on these two things, which, you know, again, are, are present uh, at, at the group's inception. And the first is, is group composition, not necessarily individual intelligence as much as we might have thought, but these other attributes that group members bring in uh, gender composition, uh, we're looking at other forms of diversity now in, in, in um, some of our studies, etc. Um, but one of the things that comes out over and over again is that mind in the eyes test, which really suggests that this uh, fostering attentiveness to others' cues seems to be a key component of this. And so perhaps that's something that can be built into more team collaboration environments to help scaffold when you don't have people who are high uh, in social perceptiveness. So, um, so this is an ability that, that seems to be key. And then another one, group structure, um, especially those aspects of group structure that really foster this equality of contribution to conversation and work product. And essentially what that is getting for the group is a broader diversity of input. Because if, if you have more members of the team contributing to the conversation or to the work we're doing, it's definitely going to be broader than if it's just one or a couple of people. Um, and so these are attributes that we were really interested in exploring further um, in the next study that I'm going to tell you about. So um, in this study, we took some of these ideas into the crowdsourcing environment. Uh, and so coming into this, you know, I'm not a crowdsourcing researcher per se. I'm coming at it, you know, from a team's lens. And a lot of the crowdsourcing literature I was familiar with really tried to take uh, projects and break them down into parts that can be done by individuals working relatively independently. And a lot of the work that I know about from by people uh, you know, in, in more of the HCII um, field are really thinking about what are better ways that we can break down and do the work and recombine you know, in a variety of clever ways to be able to, to enable more complex work to be done. We came into this wondering, well, what if we actually had the crowd workers work in teams? Uh, in, in like kind of the old-fashioned sense, you know, you actually put them together with people and have them coordinate their own work. Would that even work? Um, and if so, you know, what is it that would enable that to work uh, more effectively? Uh, so we, you know, came into this. Uh, this was a contest platform. I'll tell you about in a minute. It's a uh, platform where people were used to doing very individually based work. Uh, so this is kind of a novel thing um, when, when this was introduced. And so we were wondering if it would work at all. Um, if so, you know, are there some of these markers of collective intelligence that we can find that seem to characterize effective teams in this environment in the same way that they uh, characterize effective teams in the envir other environments we've studied? Um, and so we're not going to be able to get these teams to do our, our little set of games um, in, in this study, so we were looking for other ways to try to measure uh, collective intelligence. And then finally, and this, uh, one of my collaborators on this is an economist, they think incentives drive everything. They're like, okay, so if we just pay them, uh, you know, that will that will make a difference. And so uh, we got this platform to agree to al allow us to randomize incentives um, for the teams to see what effect, uh, additional effect that might have. So this was done in the context of top coder. 
Uh, this was a contest uh, sponsored by NASA. Uh, for this particular problem, um, the, they need to devise medical kits that anticipate the needs that might arise on a mission, but that don't take up too much space because mass and volume are very constrained um, in these situations. And so uh, what the objective was of the people entering the contest was to develop an algorithm that would minimize evacuation due to medical stuff that might happen, um, but also minimize mass and volume. And so uh, what the what this took place over um, 10 days. They could submit their code to this scoring suite that would run, you know, 10,000 simulated scenarios and determine, you know, how successful they were at uh, reducing the number of evacuations and minimizing uh, mass and volume. So uh, in this study, uh, it, we ended up with 260 participants. It was a 10-day contest. Um, they were randomly assigned to teams. And then uh, the teams were randomly assigned to an incentive condition. So if they were um, in uh, the incentive condition, um, they, they would be eligible for a prize that was a room-based prize. So there were rooms created of four teams, and if they were the best of those four teams, they would be eligible uh, for the cash prize. That was only half of the teams. The other half of the teams were in rooms, but not eligible for a prize. Everybody was also um, eligible for the grand prize, which was VIP access to the subsequent space shuttle launch. Uh, and at that point, there were only a few remaining. And then everybody was also eligible for a t-shirt, which apparently is a very big motivator for these people. So they really like these t-shirts. And uh, they had to complete a survey in order to get it. And pretty much everybody did. So uh, just to you know, be really clear about our design, so the exogenous variables here, first is the team member skill. So everybody who was part of this contest had competed in contests previously on this platform. So we had a skill rating based on their prior performance. And so uh, you know, just like I was controlling for IQ earlier, we were interested in how the, the skill of the programmers themselves would affect um, performance. We also had this incentive condition I randomized as I described. We had this team performance which was the highest score they got uh, from the scoring suite um, that they submitted their code to. And then finally, uh, we were really interested in these process markers of collective intelligence. And I'm going to walk through in more detail. But we were really interested in um, attentiveness um, to team members' communications as evidenced by level of activity on the site. Again, I'll walk through this. Um, as well as the diversity of information um, that the team members uh, communicated with each other. So in thinking about attentiveness, uh, there is work that comes out of um, physics and related fields um, done by Laszlo Barabasi and some others looking at patterns of burstiness in communication events. And so uh, prior to this work, it had been assumed that when you looked at, say, um, activity on you know, some telecommunications wires, that they would just be randomly distributed what the activities are. But you know, looking at actual data, they found that was pretty much never the case. There's always uh, correlations among the activities because you know, there are times of the day that people are calling each other, people are returning calls that they got, et cetera. And so there's, there's an inherent um, correlation that leads to this kind of heavy tail power law distribution um, of activities. Activity. Some have, including us, interpret this as humans are responsive to what others are doing in their environment. And that indicates you know, some sense of community where you see these correlations among activities. And we reasoned that we might even see variation um, in the degree to which this burstiness happens. And that would be a signal of how much these team members, in this case, are orienting toward each other. So in, in our data, uh, we have you know, a full record of all of the activity that takes place on this platform. So when people log on, when they make code submissions, when they send each other a message, uh, et cetera. And so we were interested in, the, in how bursty the pattern was um, in the communications and the activity taking place within a team and whether or not that would be a signal at all as to how well the team was performing. Um, and so just to give you examples from our data set, um, this is what a bursty team from our sample looks like. So these lines are when <laughs> stuff was happening. Um, and this is a, a non-bursty team um, from our sample. So we did, in fact, see quite a bit of variation. Um, one thing I should know, and in, in the reason why we were fascinated by this, these teams were distributed around the world. 
all of the teams uh, were diverse. So you had people from Russia, you had people from China, you had people from the US. Uh, those were probably the three most uh, represented countries, but you know there were about 40 countries represented overall um, across our sample. So very different time zones. And uh, those of you who study contests at all know, people are fitting this in around their like real life, right? So they're doing this at night, they're doing it on the weekend. If they're really motivated, they might take a day off of work to do it. Some of them are students, some of them have, have real jobs and are professionals. Some are university professors, and so they're, you know, totally whatever, um, you know, doing it at random times, right? And so, uh, so that makes, for us anyway, this bursty pattern even more interesting, because for some of these people, they're in the middle of the night, um, you know, working and sending messages back and forth. So uh, the other measure that we were interested in was uh, the diversity of communication. So as I mentioned, we have all the communications um, that were exchanged. Uh, we submitted these to an, an LDA um, model, uh, which basically puts all of the content into topics, calculates the probability um, for each topic appearing, and then um, makes a calculation of the info, information diversity of a particular message uh, based on the dissimilarity of the topics uh, that show up in the message. So we're interested in, in this as well. So to kind of, and this is just example of topics. So they talked about things like, you know, what should be in the med kit? Uh, how are we gonna test our code? People created offline testers so that they could, because sometimes it took too long to put it through the scoring suite. Uh, how should they share the code and how should we work together? Um, you know, all, all kinds of different topics. So um, what we found, and I don't know how uh, visible this is to you, but basically we started by predicting, okay, performance based on team skill and cash incentive are, are randomized um, variables. We find when those are in the equation just by themselves, they're, they're pretty significant predictors. But as soon as we start entering some of our process variables, and we have a bunch of controls, um, the time zones and so on as controls, but once we get to our process measures, these are no longer significant. So uh, information diversity um, you know, is, is a strong uh, significant predictor. The burstiness uh, is also um, a strong significant predictor when they're all in the model together. The burstiness uh, is the one that, that kind of remains a significant predictor. Um, or another way to model this is, is in a structural equation model. And basically, you know, what you see when everything's in there is that team skill you know, does lead to some you know, improvement in both burstiness and information diversity. But once again, once these are, are um, factored into the analysis, team skill doesn't have a significant effect on the, on the team score, but uh, burstiness uh, in fact does. So what we take this as, uh, you know, a conclusion of is that, A, you know, it's interesting to us that even in these, you know, crowdsourced environments that there is this kind of human element, right, where people seem to be, um, you know, motivated and engaged when I'm sending a message and, and somebody else responds right away, you know, and we can kind of iterate on something um, back and forth and, um, you know, and discuss our approach or give each other feedback or whatever. And so that, you know, factors into, uh, you know, these environments, even even in these, these very distributed, very hands-off kinds of settings. And that, you know, again, I mean, I, we remain interested in this attentiveness to cues. You know, this seems to also play out. We don't have measures of social perceptiveness of these programmers. It'd be interesting to see if that also facilitates uh, this burstiness. But we also have interest in, okay, how could these environments be set up to actually foster this in a wider variety of teams to maybe raise engagement um, for people who are, who are uh, participating uh, in these kinds of events. So just to, um, I guess, bring this uh, portion to a close, uh, across these studies, and, and there are some others I've mentioned that I haven't presented to you, um, we do seem to find this evidence of collective intelligence being something that forms relatively early, remains pretty stable, um, and is pretty predictive over time. Um, and some of the fundamental building blocks of this seem to generalize um, across teams for, that are students working together, teams of, of strangers in the laboratory, teams playing video games uh, uh, on, the, on the internet, people engaging in contests um, on the internet. Uh, so some of the fundamental building blocks really seem to be, uh, seem to generalize and suggest something fairly fundamental um, to how these relationships unfold. 
Uh, so this attentiveness to cues um, as well as the diversity of input are the things that, that show up kind of over and over again uh, and suggest ways that we might intervene uh, to create this more reliably. Uh, and so we continue to, to work to try to find these unobtrusive markers of collective intelligence to enable us to study it in a broader variety of environments. The, the battery of tasks we have is useful for certain contexts, but there are lots of other contexts we'd like to look at it in as well. So with that, I'll, I'm happy to, to stop talking uh, and facilitate a broader diversity of input in here if you have some questions. Thank you.